Okay, so that was a preview of the track that I'm going to break down today. This was the first ambient track that I ever finished, and it actually ended up being the final track on my most recent album. So I want to take you through the process of how I went from just playing around with cool ambient sounds to actually finishing something. And before we get into it, I just want to say I am recording in a different place today, so I apologize if the audio isn't quite as good. My audio, um, the the music should sound just the same. And obviously my camera looks kind of like crap because I'm just using the webcam from my laptop. But that's all I got to say. Uh, let's hop right in. I showed you a preview of how this track works. So the thing for me about making this piece and getting started in ambient music was what really helped me was using some sounds which already on their own without much processing sound really good and can carry a piece. And also on top of that, I would say that the next thing that I really focused on was setting realistic expectations for how long of a piece I was going to create. So this piece, I believe, is just short of three minutes, uh, maybe even closer to two minutes. Um, it's really not that long, but it does feel like it has this solid sort of first section here that I can highlight. And then you can see things get more busy into the second section. It's really just sort of an A, B uh, piece. It's nothing too complicated. It's got one, two, three, four, five unique tracks. Once again, nothing too complicated, but it's just a matter of getting started. And I was happy with where it ended up and it ended up being a little bit of a motivational piece, I guess you would call it, but definitely something that I would consider falling under ambient music. So let's take a listen to the first sound, which is going to come from Spitfire's Contemporary Drama Toolkit. Um, this is a great place to get started, has some really cool, awesome sounds for ambient music. This is meant as a sort of textural pack for, or, or library for film and TV and video game scoring, but it works really well for this sort of ambient soundscape. So let's hop on into the MIDI and listen to what this sounds like on its own. You can see I've got some long sustained notes. We're working with some, a little bit dissonant harmony, but mostly just sort of functioning in minor. We go up to the C minor chord, and then there's this flat five, which really stands out as being particularly dissonant here. We get the major six. Things are feeling a little weird. And it builds from there. And I'm not going to go into depth into all of the harmony and the harmonic choices here, but you can see that this is the entire MIDI of the of the piece. Um, starts in C minor, uh, gets a little bit dissonant, like I said, but really ends in a sort of classic C minor um, uh, feel to it. I will say it does use make make a lot of use of the major five, which gives it a, a little bit of that cinematic sound, that cinematic quality. But as you can see, it starts very flat in the beginning. And then in order to give it this sense of growing and having a peak towards the end, you can see that the the MIDI, you can really see it rise here and fall, which gives it this sense of, of growing and, um, and size to it. So that's the main sound. Um, it's important to play here with the velocity a little bit, although you can see there's not a ton of variation in the velocity. I definitely drew in these notes in MIDI. But um, yeah, this is a really cool sound. Um, just it's this life support patch from the Contemporary Drama Toolkit. Like I said, if I just play a minor chord, let me arm my track. This is a recurring theme of all my videos. This is just me holding down a G minor. And this is a really fun place to start just because it morphs on its own and I don't have to do a ton. So in order to give this just a little bit of life, I added some OTT. In this case, I'm using MoTT from the Slate bundle. Gives it a little bit more bite. And then the other thing, if I hop on into the envelope here, we can see that the modulation is moving up and down, giving it a little bit of, surprise, surprise, a sort of wave feeling, something I've talked about in a lot of my videos when it comes to ambient music. But this is representing this effects um, mic position here, which is just kind of adding some distortion and some life to the piece. So although the, um, the notes are very long and sustained, there is this sort of change and this wave. There's this way of adding a wave in, which once I created this, I felt like I had two minutes of something which was interesting. And 
um, was using different harmonic decisions, had a har- sort of harmonic progression to it, but also wasn't so crazy that it sounded like it was getting out of the world of ambient. It really did sound like a soundscape that was interesting. And this was how I started. Um, you can see that there's not a ton of, I'm just using cinematic rooms uh, for the reverb, which is obviously a pretty expensive reverb. Um, you don't need to to have this expensive of a reverb. Um, but it's a really nice musical sounding reverb. And I do do a lot of orchestral music. So for me, that was worth the investment. But it's not using Valhalla Supermassive or Black Hole or anything like that. This is really just a soundscape. And it was just a fun place to start. So um, yeah, finding libraries, a lot of the times, I, I know obviously these libraries, which do morph on their own, are generally speaking going to be ones which cost you money if they're going to sound really good, because it takes a lot of effort to make something which sounds really good right out of the box. But play around with some, with just whatever samples you have in the libraries you own and see if you have anything that just sort of naturally morphs on its own and use that as a starting place. And then you can learn later on how to create sounds, which do a little bit of morphing and moving. Um, But I think in the beginning, this is a great place to start. And like I said, set realistic expectations. Just try and take one sound, create a sort of chord progression, which makes use of some dissonance and grows over the course of, let's just say two and a half minutes and see where you see where you come up with. So the next thing I added as we go down was a little bit of a bassy sound. So in the second half, I'm using just a sine bass from the CDT, um, which is just playing the bass notes here as it's just going down. And you can hear, once again, this has got the OTT and the cinematic rooms, but this is just gonna be a bass sound. And it's got the mod wheel going. So there's this one note which really stands out, which is this E flat. Um, And when you combine it with the original patch, it gives it that life, that bite um, towards the end of the piece, which is really sort of moving. So let's play it just before we hit that E flat chord. You can hear it gives it some extra some extra bite. But like I said, this is just a sine wave. Um, you can use plenty of different libraries for that. Your DAW should absolutely have some sort of stock sine wave. I would hope so. Um, uh, gives it that sort of 8080 sine wave sub bass feeling, which when combined with ambient um, pads and soundscapes really can give it an emotional sort of that, that sort of tingly feeling, that um, just fullness in your chest when you're in the movie theater of the really loud thumping um, sub sound, which is a, just a really great way to um, yeah, add some real emotion, even though it's a relatively simple thing. It's just adding a bass line. Um, but you can see I added this just an octave below in the second half of the piece, just to give it a little bit more emotional weight. Now, the next thing I added was um, this patch from also from Spitfire from Eric Whitaker. Uh, let me turn off the effects. And this is from the... Um, this is, this is the Evo grid. So this is taking, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail now this works because I imagine not everyone owns this library and I don't want to spend a ton of time. But this is just taking some vocal sounds and it's a library which, you know, part of what you pay for is that it morphs a little bit on its own. So I just took some of the notes from the original chords that I laid out and the Eric Whitaker Choir Evo grid sounds like this. It's really, really quiet in the beginning. So let me fast forward a little bit. And as it sort of goes up in register later on, you can hear it beginning to do So that's that. Um, And then I just added some very basic EQ here, cinematic rooms. And then I added some DST, multiband distortion plugin. I've used it in pretty much every video. Would highly, highly recommend you checking it out if it's if you are considering spending um, some money. But um, I think it's a really great plugin. But I think there are certainly ways to do this for free just with saturation and distortion plugins. Um, this is just one that I think sounds really good and is and is worth the money. Um, but when you combine those. Uh, the reverb and and this the multiband distortion, you get something which is a little bit more bitey. And I've got this panned way out to the right just to give it a little bit more stereo width. So then combine that with the original soundscape and the sub. 
Now the vocal's off, now it's on. So then the um, next piece I added was a little bit of a sort of brassy sound. Um, if we go into the MIDI here, you can see it's just giving a little bit of actually some pretty high range brass there. I wonder if I've got it uh, bounced just to save. Yeah, so you can see I've got it tuned down. So I went up really high in this uh, brassy uh, synth patch from Albion Colossus, also from Spitfire, and then tuned it down. So that's why the... Um, Oops, oops. That's why the MIDI is up really high, but really this is playing in that sort of classic mid-range horange, horange, that classic mid-range sort of horny place uh, where the horns sound really, really good and can fill out the mid-range really, really beautifully. But I've got it up and then tuned down just to give it a little bit more bite and ambience and uh, that sort of hybrid production sound. And then I bounced um, this MIDI um, down to audio and added some saturate let me just turn off the effects actually i always do that and i think it sounds it's good to show what it sounds like without the effects so you can see that this has also got some um sort of uh, midi cc if i go into the clip and we go to the mod wheel and the expression you can see that this is going up and down in that wave giving it some volume and you can see here in the audio this sort of natural wave sound so let's take a listen to what this sounds like um let's go here in the middle maybe and you can see this is panned to the left, whereas the vocal is to the right. So this is built off of horns, but a little bit ambient, and, um, or, or a little bit more synthy, obviously. So I wanted, this definitely ends up having a little bit of a cinematic feel to it. And I think that that really helps the fact that a lot of these sounds are based off of orchestral instruments. So in order to give it more bite, I added some saturation. Some EQ just to make sure it's just in the mid-range. Cinematic rooms. And then a little bit of mid-side EQ where I'm removing some of the mono frequencies because things were getting a little bit busy. And I boost a little bit of the stereo up in that up in that mid-range. But definitely you can see the mono is a little bit filtered down in the lower registers to free up space a little bit. But this definitely helps to fill out the piece. Now if I play that along with the other three tracks in the second half, you can hear what this adds. It doesn't necessarily stand out, but it really fills things out in the second half of this piece. Um, and then the final thing I added to give it a really cinematic feel was, let me um, turn on just the EQ and the reverb of the string sound. So then I added strings because we didn't have any strings. And like I said, this is a sort of orchestral thing. So I'm using Spitfire's chamber strings. Um, you don't need to use this, once again, you don't need to use this expensive of a string library. Um, I just like, I, it's a really good quality string library. It sounds really, really pretty. And I love this um, ostinato mode. So I can draw in block chords. I can basically copy and paste the chords from the uh, sort of soundscape, the CDT patch. And then I can turn on this ostinato mode so that I don't have to draw in a bunch of shorts or play in a bunch of shorts. I can just draw in the block chords and have it do the shorts for me. So this on its own is just playing a very simple, um, very simple ostinato pattern. Let me play it in the latter half where it's a little bit louder and you can actually hear it. It is pretty quiet. But notice um, what I've got going on in order to give this some interest is that this is playing um, in this, it, I've just got three uh, eighth notes here. And so it's, and what this represents here is that the velocity on this, this patch down here, and this represents just eighth notes. So this is just chugging eighth notes, but there's an uh, sort of impacted eighth note every third note. So it gets things, even though this is still in 4-4, four, four, we're just chugging along at, at eighth notes, the impacted note, the accented note 
isn't hitting on every downbeat, which is giving it a little bit of this weird rhythm. Um, so that's what makes it sound a little bit interesting as we move along. There's this interesting pulse to it. And then one thing I've showed before, um, definitely it came up in my polyrhythm video, is adding some H delay to very basic uh, sort of moving parts with some basic rhythms can really um, add things up and give it some interest and give it some life to make it almost sound like it's real players. So let's take a listen to what this sounds like now. And then we get the resolution down into the major. That really nice resolution. So I bounced that. Um, let me turn all of this off. I bounced that out and then just added, the only thing I added to it was pancake just to give it a little bit of left and right panning. Um, so when I play this in the second half now, you can hear that this is just giving it a little bit more drive and a little bit more of that cinematic ambient feeling. Now this was the end of my album. This was, piece was titled Moments of Peace. And over the arc of the album, there's a lot of darkness. And this piece is really, I liked the sharpness of it. And I liked the way it represented those moments of peace in life that unfortunately compared to some of the dark stuff can come in much shorter bursts. But um, it does have a sort of moving, cinematic, uplifting feel to it that I really, really liked and thought that this was a great way to end, um, end the album. So let's listen to the sort of soundscape, the long drawn out patty sounds, and then I'm going to add in the strings so that you can hear that the life that this brings, even though it's really quiet, it's sort of in the background, but it gives it some nice chugging life. So now let me turn on the strings. You can really hear them here as things quiet down a little bit. Let me turn them off. And then back on. It's just some nice little chug in the background. I'll shut up now. And then on the master, I've got virtual mix rack, just with the mix bus here, a little bit of tape, and then just a limiter. So that's everything that's going on in the piece. Um, I wanted to go over some of the music parts of it first, and I, and I teased it a little bit of, of the theory of this, but up until this point, I definitely had found myself stuck in that sort of classic place of being able to create pads that were interesting, but I didn't know how to turn it into an actual song um, and turn it into something which was finished. And so for me, the getting over the hump here was really just about setting realistic expectations and letting myself grow from there. So the first and foremost thing I did was to say, all right, I'm going to create just a short piece of music. Some of my favorite ambient tracks are seven, eight, nine, ten plus minutes long. And I really wanted to make something like that, but I didn't know how. And so in order to get there, first I needed to create something that was a little bit shorter. And then the second one was to use sounds which sort of morph and sound interesting on them on their own. And to not do anything crazy other than just crumb up with a chord progression I like and then layer for interest. And with the string motor, the ostinato, which is a classic of any sort of cinematic music, not as much necessarily in ambient, but I liked the way that this one sounded. Um, it gives it a little bit of life. And that was all that I needed. Um, and it just happened to be one of those days where I created something that came together to, that sounded good. I'd been creating a lot of stuff that wasn't working. And then this one I thought did. So yeah, that was a little bit of insight in how I created my first ambient track that I actually finished. Um, and after that, weirdly enough, it just became much easier to start finishing stuff. So yeah, I would say set realistic expectations and uh, use sounds which sounds interesting on their own. And then over time, definitely it's spend some time to learn how to create the more interesting sounds. It'll help you be motivated and create more interesting stuff. But 
um, yeah, don't be afraid to start easy, relatively easy, of course. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please do leave them down in the comments below. If you found the video interesting or helpful, please do subscribe to the channel. Uh, that is it for now. I will catch you all in the next one. Take care.